hypertensive emergencies really quickly. All right. It's, it's not as benign as we think it is, you know, and we have patients come into the emergency department all the time and we sort of, they've got a high blood pressure, we're not going to do anything for you now, just follow up, you need to have some readings over a month, blah, blah, blah. Case we had a little bit ago, 64-year-old woman presents, she had a sudden onset of headache, bang, like somebody hit me in the back of the head. Past history of whatever, nobody cares, no history of headache, what do you got to rule out? Subarach, okay? So she gets a CT brain, CT brain is normal. And then I, we can do a talk on subarachnoid hemorrhage today and the subarachnoid rules and all the other rubbish and the CT within, within six hours and all of that. And about a year or two ago, I had a, we had a lovely discussion with, with the professor of research who does all the research on headaches, very clever guy, about this and about the six hour rule and about everything else. And a lot of it goes back to shared decision making with the patient. In this patient here, if I want to rule out What's the best way for me to rule it out? I'll do an LP, really. And I look for xanthochromia. I'm properly tested xanthochromia, not the woman in the lab going, oh, thank you, it's yellow, right? You've got to look it up, spectrophotometry. Is a CTA better? Nobody's ever done the studies. But the mathematical models that have been done have shown that if you do a CTA on these patients, if you don't have a lumbar puncture, you can't get it back in time, the mathematical models show that you decrease the chance of having a subarachnoid down to less than 0.5% or so. And that may be good enough. You miss about one in, I don't know, 200, 250, something, I don't know, something like that. I don't know what it is. Nobody really knows. But if you do an LP, it's got no xanthochromia, that's probably the most accepted way of doing it. So she gets put in short say, you know, she has an LP. I do the LP on her. She's got one red cell, no xanthochromia. It comes back late at night, she gets handed over and go home. Headaches resolved, blood pressure is 187 the next morning. The consultant on discharge is the patient, says it's fine, follow up with your local doctor, check your blood pressure with the local doctor, let's make sure she's fine, there's no issues at all. Comes back later on that day. Now, nothing wrong was done. Or was it? No, I don't think so. A single reading is not a big deal. But I would watch that patient maybe a little bit longer, but a single reading is not that important. So what blood pressure worries us? Anything that causes end organ damage. And if we want to, we don't fixate on a number, but it's 180 on 110 or 180 on 120 is usually what we start, we get really worried about. Antihypertensive, there's a lot that we can use. And I haven't put any... Uh, calcium channel blockers in there. But it, if I'm going to use an antihypertensive, I try to limit the number that I have be, uh, so that I don't have to think too much. And I usually pick on five. I pick on two effusions, like GTN or a sodium nitroprusside, I, esmolol, a beta blocker, I use labetalol, sort of a beta blocker, and hydralazine. They're the only ones I tend to think about. And I try to limit it to one or two, and that's all I use. So except for dissection and eclampsia, blood pressure shouldn't be lowered more than about 20 to 25% in the first hour because these patients are ischemic out. But dissection, quickly. Eclampsia, quickly. So let's go through a case. 45-year-old male presents with sudden onset, severe chest pain, uh, and I'll make it obvious, it's tearing. It goes into my back. It's, you know, and you open the textbook and you go, is that... Is it like that? And he said, yeah, yeah, tearing, you know, through the severe, you know, he's got blood pressure on 65 on 90. Okay, so he's got an acute dissection, all right, and we can see that on the chest x-ray. Our goals are to decrease the heart rate, decrease the shear force, drop the blood pressure as quickly as we can. What would you use? Think about it. Write it down. What would you use for this person here? What's the first choice? And if your pharmacy says, oh, no, we don't have that, we're cutting back on that, it's too expensive, what would, you use, uh, what would you use then? What wouldn't you use is an even better question. So is there, call out, is there any drug here you wouldn't use? Who wouldn't use labetalol? Who wouldn't use GTN? Who wouldn't use sodium nitroprusside? Who wouldn't use esmolol? Who wouldn't use hydralazine? So 99% of the room would use everything. Right, if we needed to, I agree, we wouldn't be using the infusions. GTN maybe, you can probably get away with it a little bit. 
but hydralazine definitely not. And the reason is that these things reflexively increase the heart rate, a lot of these. A hydralazine actually increases the shear force. It increases cardiac output, increases the shear force, so we don't use it for these patients. Labetalol would be my drug of choice. Labetalol would be my drug of choice for most things. The only time I don't really use it is in airways disease and acute heart failure. I tend to use it for most everything else. 20 milligrams IV over a few minutes. It starts fairly quickly. It lasts for a while. I can give more doses. I can start an infusion. It's beautiful. All right, let's look at another case. Oh, this x-ray looks very similar to the last one. Hmm. And you've got a 48-year-old 40, male, sudden, severe, ripping pain. You've got classic chest x-ray. You make sure you didn't look at the last patient's x-ray. No, this is this patient. It looks exactly the same. Wide mediastinum, and you get an ECG. And you've diagnosed Hockham on this ECG. He's got left ventricular hypertrophy, and he's got some T-wave inversion changes of hypertrophy. So what do you use for this person? Is there something you don't use for this particular person? So in this person, you'd want to use a beta blocker. You don't want to use anything that will actually make your outflow tract obstruction worse. So anything like an infusion, for example, can affect the flow and can affect your outflow tract. So, and you can read that as best as I can, even nitroprusside. So I would stick again you know, with a beta blocker. Case four, 68-year-old male presents with sudden severe headache and arm weakness. He's got this on his ECG. We know if you have high blood pressures in these guys, the volume of blood increases significantly. And you really want to decrease the blood pressure. And again, we're not quite sure. The literature's a bit weird on this, but... 140 to 160, some people say for a bleed 140, for a subarach bleed 160. The studies that have been shown, done have shown that these blood pressures have gone down to 110 with no adverse event. But about 140 to 160 is what we talk about in these patients here. So what are you going to use? You can use, is there something you wouldn't use? Who wouldn't use labetalol? Who wouldn't use hydralazine? Who wouldn't use GTN? Why wouldn't you use GTN? What about sodium nitroprusside? Yeah. So I think the infusions are a little bit of a concern, and the reason being, and we're not quite sure about GTN as much, but you know, these the the problem with these is they may increase intracranial pressure. What if you've just got an ischemic stroke? These are a little bit of a concern. These ones here, you've got to be a little bit careful. We don't want to take the blood pressure down too far in these. So when you've got a, a bleed, I, I wrote a blog a little while ago called The, uh, the uh, Penumbrum Conundrum, and it was all about the peripenumbrum ischemia. And it's really a flow issue, and it's not the same as if you have an ischemic stroke. Um, and in these guys here, what we want to do is, if you're going to give them thrombolysis, well, you've got to be careful. You've got to take the blood pressure down for thrombolytics. But if you're not going to give them thrombolysis, you want to leave the blood pressure up pretty high because this is what they do. They're perfusing. So you don't want to mess with it too much. Here's a case I was discussing with a, a, a renal physician who's an obstetric medicine expert uh, two days ago. 38 year old, nine days postpartum, she's due to have her caesarean section sutures out, but she's had this niggling headache that morning. So she just thought on the way to our patients, she'll just pop into the emergency department, just get seen, get a flu shot while she's there, you know, get a few other things checked out, ingrown toenail treated, all those other things that need to be done. And you find that she's got a blood pressure of 160 something. So we've got to be very careful in these patients. Any patient from 20 weeks up to about two weeks postpartum, eclampsia, preeclampsia is what we're worried about. So any blood pressure rise above 140 or 90 is a bit of a concern. 
So we need to be very careful about these. Now, if they've had hypertension and pregnancy and a few other things, they're different. But a normal, otherwise normal patient has now got a blood pressure. Do we have to rush into this patient? She's got a niggling headache. It's not too bad. You can actually go gentle on this. But, you know, we're an emergency. We, we, we want to take everything down quickly. So we might give some IV. You could potentially give some oral medication in that particular patient. But if we wanted to, we can give some IV. But we need to take it down quickly. There's nothing wrong with taking it down quickly in eclampsia. And there's nothing wrong with taking it down quickly in dissection. And so you think about what drugs would you give and drug, what drug wouldn't you give here? So you could potentially give everything except sodium nitroprusside just purely because there's a, a risk of cyanide toxicity. Labetalol is taken over as the drug of choice. It used to be hydralazine. Labetalol is taken over now. There's another case. We had a 27-year-old male executive presents agitated with chest pain. He's tachycardic and a blood pressure of 190, 125. He's a very stressful job. He's sweaty. And you say, um, what did you do last night? OK, so this is the classic business executive uh, who comes in. Is there a drug that you'd use? Is there a drug you wouldn't use? You've got to be careful with these guys. Beta blockers are contraindicated in this group because what you don't want to do is you don't want to create unopposed alpha activity. Because what happens is they become even more hypertensive. So what you want to do is benzo them. Give them some midazolam. Calm them down. They'll be fine. So what do I give? Labetalol is my go-to drug. I give it to pretty much everybody, except if they've got stimulant-induced hypertension, like this guy, if he's been snorting something, I don't give it to him, or if, he's got, if they've got heart failure. Or, you know, even airways disease, you can get away with labetalol. It's not a big deal but I don't give it to these groups. Pretty much everybody else will get labetalol. What if I can't get it? Well, I give hydralazine as my, as my next go-to drug, except if they've got myocardial ischemia. Um, and we've got to be a little bit careful because you don't want to cause reflex tachycardia or increase myocardial demand in these patients. And I don't do it for um, thoracic aortic dissection because it does increase that shear load. So, no hydralazine. What do you do now? And, and you know, I, it's really strange what happens in hospitals where pharmacy just decide to scrap drugs without asking anybody, and then you ask them, well, we don't have that anymore. Oh, really? So, so what do I give next? Well, maybe sodium nitroprusside might be my next go-to, except for a couple of those. It's really strange, though. Labetalol used to be very difficult to find in Australia. Now, most EDs should have labetalol. And, and certainly you can find hydralazine in just about every ED. And there's, I think I've put one of these charts in there for you as an approach to these patients. And there's a lot of controversy in the literature about what you use. But that's a fairly simplistic approach to think about one or two drugs that you're always going to keep in your armamentarium.